I just want you all to know it's, it's a great pleasure to be here today because uh, being chairman of the board of Shared Hope International takes me a lot of places. And unfortunately, a lot of them aren't here at home. I'm a Colorado, you know, I live here in Colorado Springs with my wife, Donna, so it's wonderful to be here. And I just want to uh, make a couple of statements right off the bat. What you folks are doing here is amazing. For a town this size to have this kind of turnout and to have this kind of organization is truly amazing. Uh, this is not the normal thing that I see when I travel around the country. So I think uh, we should give all those involved here with the, the human trafficking for Southern Colorado some applause. I mean, right now, because they're doing a great job. You know, I'm going to, uh, I guess, do a couple different things today. I'm going to give you a little background on Shared Hope, just so uh, many of you that have been involved in this battle, uh, as Shared Hope has for about the last 16 years, are familiar with Shared Hope, but many of you are new to this fight. So I want to give you a little background on Shared Hope. Uh, then I'm going to give you kind of a little idea of the scope of the problem we're facing all over this nation. Uh, because, as I say, I do get around a little bit to different parts of the country. In fact, just... Uh, Last week I was in Las Vegas, and uh, it's funny how things work. I've told a couple people already. Uh, I'd met Ellie before, you know, with our human trafficking uh, department here in Colorado Springs, and, and I just want you to know they're doing an amazing job. They don't have a big staff. They don't have the resources they need, and they're doing an amazing job. And it was interesting because I met with Karen Hughes uh, last this past Monday in Las Vegas. She's the head of the the task force on uh, trafficking in uh, Las Vegas for the Las Vegas Police Department. Obviously, they've got 24 full-time detectives, and you know it's an amazingly large job that they have to deal with. But you know, it's a great talking to her. And then I, I talked to Ellie after this today. And she says, you know, we've been talking about we've got approved to get some training uh, in Vegas because we know the problems they have there, and they're doing so much, and we want to see how they're doing things. And I said, well, I just talked to Karen last week or this week and so I'm going to connect the two of them make sure that that happens because Karen's doing an amazing job in Las Vegas and believe me that's a very very difficult market to try to do anything with because we all know there's this that old saying about what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas unfortunately that's true and yet you've got amazing police department folks that are trying to work so hard at the, dealing with the evils of uh, child sex trafficking and prostitution. So that's how these things work. And so I'm just excited to be here. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to talk about the, the local laws, what's been done. Um, as Ellie said, the laws weren't always good here in Colorado. They're getting better really fast. And we're going to talk in some detail about the laws and how work many of you have done and some of your legislators here in the state have done to make the laws much, much better, which gives our police forces the ability to do the things they need to do, and then our prosecutors and ultimately our judges. Uh, Shared Hope started uh, about 16 years ago. Linda Smith was uh, our founder. She's still uh, our CEO. Uh, she was a congresswoman in, from Vancouver, Washington. And she was in Mumbai, India. Uh, and one of her colleagues um, for congressional business, and one of her colleagues said, Linda, you need to see what's happening just two blocks from the beautiful hotel we're staying in in Mumbai. And he took her to the red light district in Mumbai, India. And there were literally thousands and thousands of young girls just being trafficked right in front of everybody. I mean, just street after street. And one of the little nine-year-olds saw Linda and you know, she knew this was unusual. You didn't see many women in that area, except for women that were being trafficked. And the little nine-year-old ran up to Linda and just gave her a hug. And then she was led away. That changed Linda Smith's life. That changed the fight for children being trafficked in many respects. That day, things changed because of the work Shared Hope has done. Linda got back to her hotel, called uh, one of her congressional supporters and said, I need $25,000 today. We're going to build a safe house. So a safe house was built outside of Mumbai. We built safe houses in Nepal, Jamaica, Fiji. We've helped build six or eight around the United States. And so that's the one, the one you know, we always talk about, what does Shared Hope do? Well, we kind of have a, a motto. We try to prevent sex trafficking. We try to restore the victims, 
and we want to do justice. We're going to spend some time later, I know Debbie and I are going to talk about doing justice and really starting to hit the man, which is the key to this battle. We'll talk about that later. So from those humble beginnings in Mumbai, Shared Hope has done many, many things. And starting in 2011, we came out with the Protective Innocence Challenge, which is really kind of interesting because what we do is we have offices in Washington, D.C. also. We have lawyers on staff there that have written many of the prototype legislation that's been used throughout the country to get the laws where they need to go so that we can make a difference in this battle. And in the Protective Innocence Challenge, we rate every state in the United States every year on 41 areas of law dealing with child sex trafficking. Everything from the restoration side to uh, attacking the demand side through the Johns, the, uh, you know, being able to prosecute pimps to the full extent of the law, all these different areas. And it's kind of a big deal. Um, I don't even know what Colorado's new rating is that we're going to be releasing in about 10 days. It's kind of like the you go to the Academy Awards and they bring out an envelope. I don't even know what it is, but I'm very optimistic Colorado's going to get a better rating. 2011, Colorado got an F. Yeah. But people like you are making a difference, believe me. 2012, 2013, Colorado got a D, which is an improvement, but I don't know, I don't think any of us want Ds, right? But there's been some great changes this year, so I'm optimistic for this year. Um, you know, when Linda started Shared Hope, to show you where this has come in 16 years, 46 states in the United States, it was a misdemeanor to pay for sex with a child. Think of that, a misdemeanor. Well, I'll tell you today that right now, it's in 47 states now, it's a felony to pay for sex with a child. And that's been a big battle. Because, you know, I think many of you at one time probably, if somebody would have told you that child sex trafficking is a problem right here in Colorado Springs or right here in Colorado or even in the United States, you would have said, you're kidding me. I thought it was in Thailand or I thought it was in the Philippines or Mumbai or Nepal. But people are starting to learn. Uh, the last study I saw said still 80% of Americans don't know it's a big problem in the United States. So that's where you're all going to come into this and people like you all over the country. Because people telling people, people going back to their churches, all, that, the, all those things is how we get the word out. And it's going to change. We're seeing the change. How many of you in just the last two, three years have seen more articles about child sex trafficking in the last year or two than you have in your whole life? How many? I think we all have. That's great. And we're seeing that happen day after day after day. As I said, Shared Hope and you know, Polaris Organization out of New York have been very, very, very instrumental in changing laws. And that was the first thing we had to do to make a difference in this battle. The next thing that has to be done and where Shared Hope is starting to put a lot of our emphasis is on the demand side. But we had to get the laws changed first. And that's been happening, so that's great. And I'll talk more about that here in a little bit. Um, let me give you an idea about the, the national scope of this problem. Best estimates, somewhere over 100,000 young girls under the age of 18 are trafficked every day in this country. 100,000. And this has been an amazing morning of, you know, listening to the different speakers. They have been right on in everything they've said. Now, I used to be a professor. I like to critique people and things. But listen, they did such a great job, and they were right. Their facts were right on point. This is an evil that is hard for any of us to really understand the depth that it goes to. I've talked to lots of survivors. I talked to one girl that was sold by her father at the age of 12 and was kept outside in a brothel outside of Quantico Marine Base. And she serviced GIs every day, 8 to 10 to 12 per day for six years. Things like this are happening all over the country. And we can't allow that to stand. We simply cannot allow that to be happening in this country. 
give you a little background on a, a board meeting I had, I guess it was about six months ago now, well, four months ago with Shared Hope. And we have all people from the United States that are on our board. And, but we have one person who's uh, the number two uh, person in Microsoft in Asia. And she's Malaysian Chinese, an amazing lady. I mean, she's, she's smarter than the rest of us put together on the board. I think that's fairly safe to say. But she's passionate about this cause. And there were some on our board that thought maybe we, you know, we're putting about 70% of our resources into domestic, the domestic fight. And about 30% still goes overseas. And some on the board were saying, hey, we, we, maybe we should put more money back into the international fight because we get more bang for our buck internationally. And that's true. We do. I mean, it's much easier to build a safe house and have 80 young ladies and maybe their babies in there and have counseling and stuff than you can do it here in the States. You know, government's wonderful, but there's a lot of regulations. It can, makes things difficult. And luckily, this lady, Sandra Go, said, well, as the only person on this board that's not a U.S. citizen, and since I come from a part of the world where sex trafficking is so, so widespread, I think you need to look at the fact that before you come over and try to tell people in our part of the world how to deal with sex trafficking, we should deal with it here in the United States where we have good laws, good judges, good police forces, and a public that cares. And I agree with that. And that's why we're putting our emphasis here in the States. We're seeing something that's very troubling. Uh, the police can talk about it, we can't all talk about it. Gangs are moving into this in a very big way. There is some articles written in San Diego a while back that said that the gangs in San Diego are making more money selling young girls now than they are drugs. We kind of saw that today when Slim, or whatever his name was, the pimp, was talking about how you, know, you can sell a drug once and it's gone. But you can sell a little girl every day, every night, until she's used up. And that's basically the way they talk. And yet with drugs, it's true. There's a lot of sting operations, and you, it, it's easy to get caught and go to prison. But a lot of the people in this industry stay in the background. And they have what they call the bottom girl that runs a lot of it. And the pimp stays in the background, and it's hard to get those guys. And so that's why it's growing, and it's growing all over the country. You know, you kind of wonder sometimes, is, it, is, the, is the problem growing, or are we just doing a better job? It's probably both. I mean, we're catching more, and we're prosecuting more. But at the same time, I do think we're at a point where it's still in the growing stages in many parts of the country. But I can tell you one thing. We're at a very critical moment in this nation when it comes to fighting child sex trafficking. And we're going to win this battle. I promise you, this battle will be won. Because of people like you, because of people like Ellie, people like Karen that I met with in Las Vegas last week. We're going to win this battle. We really are. Something else, too, you know, we, that people say, well, who are these young girls? They're mo aren't most of them, they come across the border, don't they? No, no. no it's not. See, we, people know this. No, about 75% are American kids that are trafficked out of that 100,000. A lot of them are runaways. 70% of the runaways have been sexually molested in their home or by somebody they know. They're leaving one kind of hell, and they end up in something they never believed could be their life in a much worse place. That's what's happening every day in this country. And the people that are taking advantage of these young kids are very good at what they do. They know exactly what to do. There's even been books written about it, how to be the best pimp. Amazon used to have it. I think Amazon took it off finally, thank goodness. But it's an industry, folks, and it's powerful. But 75% of the kids are our kids. Sure, there are some that are coming across the border, clearly. The Russian mafia has brought some into the East Coast. Some come from Jamaica and Dominican Republic. But generally, they're our kids. And it shouldn't happen here. 
but it does. The internet has changed everything. Absolutely. You know, but Ellie showed Backpage.com. Just in one day, did you see all those? I mean, there's picture after picture after picture. And there's men calling those things every single day to meet girls. Hopefully, the younger the better is the way they think. And there's a, there's a push towards younger women. I've talked to policemen in D.C. and Las Vegas, and there's a trend towards younger and younger girls because guys think, well, they're less apt to have a disease. They won't have AIDS. They won't have other types of venereal diseases. So they literally say, I want the youngest you've got. And that's what's driving this. But we're making progress, and we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. You know, we've tried to, there's lawsuits against Backpage.com, congressional bills trying to deal with that, but the reality is, even though Backpage.com gets about $30 million a year just from revenue from those kind of ads that you saw this morning, but even if Backpage is out of the business eventually, somebody else will come right up. That's how the internet works. I mean, that's, the internet's done many great things, but this is a terrible thing that it has done. And so that's going to be with us for the rest of our lives. That's why we think we've got to go to demand, to hit demand, to stop this problem. You know, we've got a lot of organizations here in this state, all over the country, that are building a few safe houses and for restoration of victims, and that is great work. That's amazingly good stuff. Every, every child that they work with literally saves a life, saves a soul, gives a person a hope and a chance. Because there are victories out there. I've talked to survivors that are amazing, amazing stories. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Rebecca Bender. Uh, Googler, amazing life. She was uh, trafficked and yet she's gone on to do amazing things and speaks all over the country. But, you know, for all the safe houses we build, we cannot build enough. There is no way in the world, folks, you go to any major city in this country, they say, we have one bed for every hundred young girls that we need to put somewhere. One. So we can't build enough. That's why we have to go to demand. We've got to go to the root of the problem. And Debbie, I can't wait to talk about that in more detail with you in a little bit. Let's talk about Colorado. What have we done here? Like I say, we were an F three years ago. Things are changing. Um, you know, one thing about lawyers, I am a lawyer, and I've been a prosecutor. And, you know, lawyers, uh, if you're on the defense side of issues, you're always looking at every law that your person's being charged under to see what the loopholes are. And there were some big loopholes in our laws until this year, and that's changed. I want to talk about House Bill 1273. It was signed May 29th of this year. Then I also talk about House Bill 1148. It was signed on April 4th. These bills are revolutionizing fighting sex trafficking in this state. As Ellie said earlier, totally changed the dynamics. 1273 criminalizes domestic minor sex trafficking. Now, Domestic minor sex trafficking, I'll call it DMST. That's actually a phrase that Shared Hope coined a few years ago, and now it's used in all the, the fight here. It's kind of good if occasionally you can come up with something that catches on, and we did. But uh, 1273 criminalizes domestic, sex, dis, domestic minor sex trafficking without proving force, fraud, or coercion. That's huge from a lawyer's standpoint. Because in the old days, under the old law, if you had somebody that was with a child, he could say, well, hey, I, she wanted to do this. I didn't have to coerce her. I mean, I didn't, you know, she wanted to do that. If he had to prove fraud, if he had to prove physical force, it's hard to prove that. So you might get right to the point, and then you end up plea bargaining the case down to something less. So that's a huge deal by not having to prove force or fraud or coercion to be charged with DMST under the law. That also brings us into line, as AJ said earlier, with 42 other states in this country and the District of Columbia. So we're in good company there. That shows how the, the states are moving so fast. Second thing it does, 
1273 once again. It brings sex trafficking within the racketeering law. Now this is kind of legalese, but you know, remember I used to teach law at the academy, so bear with me for a second. But racketeering laws are amazingly powerful. You can fine people up to a million dollars. You can have civil liability of huge amounts. And that's something that never was brought into the domestic sex trafficking battle. That's a big deal. And now the racketeering laws are so powerful, and now it falls within that here in Colorado, which we need to. Another great thing, another great part of the law. And here's where I get really excited. I haven't been excited up to now, you may not know that, but trust me, this really gets me excited. When we're talking about the buyers of these young children, the Johns, now if you're having sex with a minor as a John, it becomes a trafficking offense immediately. The significance of that is twofold. One, the types of penalties, you know, many, five years for a felony, I like that. That's never been done before, that's important. But they also, these Johns, can't just hire a lawyer and try to get a plea bargain down, because it's harder now because the laws are so much better, and the prosecutors, you know, prosecutors prosecute cases they can win. If it's a case they can't win, what do they do? They'll try to plea bargain it down, get something that's better than nothing. They're not going to have to do that in this state anymore. They can push for solid prosecutions. And those sex traffickers, those Johns, are going to have to register as sex offenders. That's important. It used to be, you know, somebody that was a rapist or somebody that was a pimp and a trafficker, they'd have to register as a sex offender, but never the John. Because what's happened in this country for years and years, the police will arrest the young girl and tell the John to go home to his wife. That can never be done again in this country. It should never happen. That's great news. Really good news. And what we want to see, we want to see their pictures in the paper. Good. Yep. Right there with the, their name and what, that they're a sex offender and what happened. On the front page. On the front page. <laughs> we're not talking back page there, we're talking front page. How many of you know who Lawrence Taylor is? Lawrence Taylor, Hall of Fame football player, New York Giants. Well, a few years ago he was arrested. He was arrested for having sex with a 16-year-old. Paid her $300. Mm. And there's, you can go to the internet and find it. Uh, it used to be on our website at Shared Hope. I, I kind of think somebody tried to make us take it down. I don't know if it's down now or not, but we had it up there for a while anyway. But it, you can find it on the internet. It shows him being interviewed about this. Here's a guy, Hall of Fame, made a fortune, and he's saying stuff like, well, you never know how old they are. Sometimes they're young, sometimes they're old, sometimes they're pretty, sometimes they're not. You just kind of get what you can. Well, you know, we've got a petition, by the way. You can't go to Shared Hope's uh, website and sign it. We're sending it to ESPN. We don't want ESPN ever hiring him as a color analyst again. Yes. Let's hit them where their pocketbook is. That's what we've got to do. That's part of the battle. Well, Lawrence Taylor, for that offense, Anybody want to guess how much time he did? None. You got it. Zero. He pled to a misdemeanor. There's going to come a time where everybody like the Lawrence Taylors of this world, I don't care if they're a pro football player, a congressman, a pastor, a military member, or a truck driver, or a policeman, they're going to go to prison. Yes. Another big thing that 1273 does, this is one great law, folks. Yes, it is. Done. If we don't get a better grade this time, I'm going to find out why. So this is my organization. We're making these things up. But, um, it's no longer a defense to have the mistake of age defense. In other words, you 
say, hey, I wanted to have sex with an adult lady. I didn't know she was 14. She told me she was 18. Well, it used to be mistake of age was a defense. Not in Colorado anymore. It's kind of like the old days, you know, it's a statutory uh, liability, a, a strict liability level. Remember how if a 24-year-old man has sex with a 15-year-old girl, consensual sex, and he, they find out that it happened, the police can go after him under statutory rape, right? Mm -hmm. That's a felony. It's been done for years. That's how it should have been in this area, but it wasn't. Now, if a man has sex with a girl, no matter how old he thought she was, even if she showed her, she showed him an ID, which, by the way, a lot of these girls have IDs, fake IDs. You'd be amazed. Go to Las Vegas. See how many young girls have IDs that say they're 19. And they're not. But it makes no difference now. If you had sex with that girl, you pay for sex with that girl, and you're caught, it's a felony, and mistake of age is not a defense. That's another great thing this law does. I like this law. <laughs> it's a great law. You better believe it. And that's why we need good legislators, folks. Got to have them. It's important. We got to have people that take this seriously and want to change this culture. Now let's talk about what 1273, we already heard what it does. 1148 is not quite as broad, but it's got one very powerful part that also is shared in 1273. It prohibits the defense based on consent of the minor. L.A. kind of alluded to it today. A lot of these young children, I mean, you talk about the Stockholm Syndrome. How many people know what that is, Stockholm Syndrome, where, you know, somebody's kidnapped, and they, the person that's kidnapped starts to really relate to their kidnapper or the, the person that's abusing them. That happens with these young girls and young children all the time. I mean, imagine being a 13-year-old girl, and you're being... Rape, basically, 8, 10, 12 times a day, every day. And if you don't make enough money, the pimp beats you or doesn't feed you. Stockholm Syndrome is with almost all these young girls. And you talk about post-traumatic stress. Those of us that have been in the military, you know, we're, we're familiar with the, how that affects the military. But military members are trained, and they still have it. What about a 13 or 14-year-old child? So quite often, historically, they can arrest a guy for being with a girl that's 14 years of age, and she'll say, well, I wanted to do this. I mean, first of all, they'll say there was no money exchange. No, I wanted to do this. Because she knows if she doesn't, the pimp will beat her. He might kill her. That happens. How often have you read in the papers about young women that disappear and they don't even get reported because they're in this dark area of being trafficked. They've been missing for five years. And then you find some guy that has raped and murdered eight women, and seven of them never got reported. That's who these people are. So by taking away that defense that the minor consented to it, that's another wonderful thing. Once again, no defense. You're caught with the young girl, you're going to be prosecuted, and you're going to go to jail. Some of the next steps we've got to take here in Colorado for 2015 for the laws. There's still a few things we can do. Uh, number one, uh, we have to ensure laws that make sure that domestic minor sex traffickers, traffic children, DMST, 